thanks for all, uh, all of you for coming. Uh, my name is Suresh Garamella. I'm the Executive Vice President uh, for Research and Partnerships at Purdue University. Uh, that's my current job. And uh, I, great showing. I'm slightly flattered and mildly embarrassed to have TVs and all of you here. But uh, uh, it's great to see the excitement uh, in town. And it shows you how important UVM is to the state. Uh, and to the region, so it adds to my excitement. Um, you know, what, what drew me to UVM was that it's a land-grant university, it's one of the oldest universities with great medical school, a long history of a liberal arts program um, that everyone's proud of, it's an inclusive place, it's a diverse place, so working hard towards it. Um, and so it seems like there's just great faculty, um, wonderful students, lovely city certainly in a setting um, despite all you've all done to make it uh, colder uh, when I come but um, it, it seems like it's a great place and I'm sort of ex I'm excited about what what the next step is for UVM and uh, where we can get from here sort of working inclusively towards a, a strategic plan a vision ways to enhance our resources from multiple uh, diversified sources and try to get to the goals that we've uh, laid out for ourselves. Um, as you know, <laughs> I work at a different university. It's not, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know UVM as well yet. Um, I'm here mostly to learn. Um, I, I've met over 100 faculty members uh, and staff and such in the past. I had a great set of meetings already today and we'll have more. So, um, each, each meeting I have is uh, uh, more revealing, and I learn a lot of uh, more positive things about UVM and, and some of the challenges, which happen to be, by and large, challenges across higher ed. So I'm happy to chat with you uh, and, and answer any questions you might have. So let's, let's get on with that. <laughs> so fundraising is just about the president's principal job now. In so. higher education, I'm going to say it, yeah. Um, how do you see yourself as a salesman for the university? Well, you'll have to decide how I do here, but, um, y you know, uh, we've done quite well in my, in my current role. Um, uh, certainly on the research side, uh, again, for the last few years, we've had a record funding uh, in research from very diverse sources. Um, our private giving has been uh, very robust in terms of the number of donors and the amount that have contributed. Uh, from my analysis and, and my understanding of where UVM is, I think you have uh, very happy alumni uh, that uh, I, th I think would be, my sense is, they'd be happy to be engaged with the campus and contribute to campus. Uh, and I think the, the important thing is to have a clear vision. I think most, most folks who want to give back want to support the vision uh, and, and know we're going somewhere. So uh, President Sullivan's done a great job over the last few years um, and I'm certainly going to do my best to continue that trajectory and, and, and broaden the uh, number of folks we reach um, and, and tell the story of, of UVM. I need to learn more, but as I do, I will be happy to um, to, 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 to work with friends and, and, and alumni and, and donors and foundations and federal agencies, etc. So I think there's a lot to be done, but there's great potential for uh, raising those resources. You mentioned the challenges across higher ed. Um, many colleges across New England are seeing challenges of shrinking demographics. How will we combat those challenges and the inevitable UVM will face some of those? Yes. So I think there are nationwide challenges to higher ed that include the fact that graduation, that the number of high school graduates has been dropping, as you probably know. Um, certainly, New England has its own unique set of challenges. I think UVM is very well placed. Um, you already tap into a very rich pool of uh, students from across the region. My, my sense is that uh, many Parents in the region uh, want to send their students to UVM. Um, you've certainly got a, a, an important
importance to the international student population. So I think that the challenges to higher ed are also that you cannot sort of have a business as usual approach to the financial challenges and such. Um, a model where tuition goes up regularly forever is just not sustainable. Certainly at Purdue, we've frozen tuition for seven years in a row. Um, it's cheaper to attend today than uh, attend Purdue today than it was in 2012. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know that that's exactly the right answer for UVM, but you want to make it as affordable and as accessible as possible. Um, you also want to have provide very good reasons why students want to come here. I think you need to be distinctive. Um, they need to be specific areas of research and, and teaching and such and programs that attract students. Um, and I think, again, like the, the previous question, it, it needs clear communication and messaging. I'd be very happy to contribute to that. So you mentioned Purdue. Uh, Purdue is kind of seen as a innovator in higher education in some ways. Uh, what would you try to bring from Purdue uh, to UVM? And is there anything that Purdue has tried which you would not want to bring from UVM? It's a great question. Um, you know, I would, I would say really at the outset that it's, it's not as if my goal is to transfer you know, a bunch of things we did at Purdue to UVM. Um, the challenges to higher ed are relatively um, uniform across higher ed. There are some special localized uh, challenges too, but the solutions aren't always, uh, you, you know, you cannot sort of cut and paste, they're not cookie cutter solutions. So it's very important um, for me to state that I don't come with a recipe book that has been tried elsewhere that would just apply here. That said, I think the approach to these things, which is to have a very clear North Star, I think it's important for the campus community and the region, as in the, 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 the city, the, the state, to articulate a clear vision, a strategy for where it's trying to go. And once you do that, the tactics that you apply can be flexible and you can try different things that apply. Certainly some of the things we've tried at Purdue are laser focus on efficiencies and, and making school affordable and accessible to a diverse community. Um, I, I, you know, we, we, we did some fairly inorganic things, as in not simply more of the same, but we uh, started a high school in Indianapolis to add to our, um, you know, to the sort of the people of color, the underrepresented um, students, because that pool is always challenged. Um, you know, we've also, we, there's Purdue Global now, which, um, which used to be Kaplan and purchased it so that we could reach a very different section of the population uh, who, who probably would never come to West Lafayette and uh, spend four years there. So I think there are experiences that I have learned from which would certainly um, enrich the conversation here, I'm hoping, but we will need to find solutions here that people with a lot of wisdom will need to come together around the table and contribute. This is staff, this is faculty, this is students. The last time that uh, UVM searched for a president, they named five finalists publicly. Uh, this time they've just named one. Uh, how do you feel about being the sole finalist for this job? So as you can imagine, uh, I did not set the process. Um, I have participated in one other search that was very open, um, painfully open. Uh, but I did not uh, set any rules about how I would participate. If there had been a multiple, you know, multiple finalists that came to campus with an open search, I would not have objected. But the process arrived at this, uh, this uh, way of doing things, and I'm participating in it. That said, I would say that there are important reasons why most universities are going this route. Uh, you could look across many presidential searches, even this year, that have all gone for either a completely um, private sort of search, a confidential search, and they announce a, a, a president, or uh, they, they do the sole finalist approach. So it's not unusual at all. I see why they've done that, but this is not something I asked for. 
after a, your first Can you few meetings. Explain why they're doing oh, this. What? Why has this trend shifted? Um, well, what's across. what's different now from uh, that's driving this trend? Yeah. So I will uh, answer the trend rather than why they did it here. So. Um, you want the best candidates possible, and there are candidates who have existing jobs, say for example, they're a sitting president somewhere. If they think that UVM, for example, or another university offers them a great um, vehicle for their next step, um, and they're one of multiple candidates, then you know, it, it's, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, position them well at their existing campuses. And you might say, you know, why should we worry about them? Well, the point is you want to get the best candidates, the most, the richest pool you can. And I think it's helpful to uh, do your search such that you get the best candidates possible. Uh, as you know, UVM's make, making a push to expand its STEM graduates. Uh, you're a, an engineer. Art, does that make you the right candidate for UVM at this point in time? Do you have any new insights after your first meetings on campus? I'm an engineer, you got that right, thank you. Um, and proud of it. Uh, so, I can speak for myself. I can also guess that UVM didn't pick me because I'm an engineer. I hope they didn't, because I'm not coming here to be an engineering professor. A really good one, but that's not the job. I think it's my administrative experience, it's the strategies we've uh, applied to things at a, at a, at a large university. Um, it's, it's that I have been at uh, public research institutions all my time. And so I think what I would bring to UVM is, is those experiences. Um, I have been in my role, in my current role, very supportive of the humanities and liberal arts. There's a good number of programs we uh, instituted to support them and to bring them more deeply into the rest of the campus fabric. I'll just give you one example. Um, so, so it's a small one, but let's, you know. So we received a Mellon grant, I was one of the investigators for it, from the Mellon Foundation, and the stipulation, how we, how we put it out there is that anyone who was to draw funds from that grant, uh, any group, had to be led by a humanities or social science faculty member, a liberal arts person. It had to have a scientist or an engineer in it, and it had to have a librarian in it for the dissemination side of things. Just setting those boundaries, those boundary conditions, led to such an interesting set of proposals that came from across campus. So the humanities and, and liberal arts and social sciences at Purdue are very much more integrally part of campus. We established, one of the first things I did was to bring about a, what's called a Purdue Policy Research Institute. Um, it's at the heart of our Discovery Park. Discovery Park is something we're pr very proud of. It's our interdisciplinary sandbox. About a thousand faculty members interact there, work on big challenges. And the Purdue Policy Research Institute, which has communications faculty, political science faculty, English faculty, and such, has become the hub, the, 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 the center of all large efforts there because, as you know, these wicked problems need the policy element quite centrally. So there's multiple things we've done along those lines. Um, so I would say that I would not recommend you view me as an engineer coming in to somehow advance STEM. Certainly there's a great need for STEM graduates. The medical school um, uh, has a wonderful record and could grow further. So obviously I would be supportive. Um, but I come here to take UVM, if they will let me, to whatever uh, that next step is that we all collectively arrive. So, so that's exactly the, 
challenge that higher ed faces. Um, federal grants in real dollars are pretty much flat. State appropriations are either flat or declining in some cases. I don't think we should look to somehow be able to modify that. That's, be that as it may, I think we need to figure it out. Um, as I said, I don't believe that continually increasing tuition is the answer. Household debt has gone from, uh, the, the student debt as a, as a fraction of household debt, has gone from 4% to 11% in a very short time, in just about a decade. And so we've done this at Purdue, at least. One solution is you're far more careful, plan, you know, have a fiscal plan that's very um, focused on efficiencies. Wherever you can find efficiencies, uh, you, you exploit them. Um, and yet, we've done it, just to preempt the next question, if you will. Uh, we've, we've frozen tuition for seven years while still making major investments in, uh, in, in strategic research initiatives, having buildings, an honors college building that went up, et cetera. So it is possible to do. I think one has to take a very uh, careful approach and understand the financial model very well. At Purdue, we think of $10,000 as a student tuition unit. The moment you start thinking like that and weigh everything in student tuition units, it starts bringing a new discipline to you. So again, if you said what at Purdue would apply here, I'm not suggesting that is the exact thing one could do here, but um, I don't think the sky is falling. Um, I think that you do more with the resources you've got, uh, you, you increase your efficiency, and like the first question, you uh, there are a lot of people who want to support UVM, and you uh, raise as much support for things that our friends and donors are passionate about, uh, and you increase your federal uh, sort of uh, research uh, presence and, and grow that. So I think there, the tweaks are obviously, there are many, many levers you can play with. The, the, the answer is to recognize them all and, and adjust them uh, carefully. So kind of jumping off that, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences is seeing decreasing uh, enrollment here, faculty are upset about some cuts there. Uh, you know, are, you have a STEM background, are you confident that you could, you know, uh, help bolster that arts and sciences, and do you have any specific ideas on how to kind of turn around enrollment there and, you know, build, build, build that back up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly, um, I don't believe, like your colleague asked earlier, that whether you have an engineer or a biologist or a history professor, I think what you need is um, a good understanding of higher ed, of future trends. And I think we should all be eyes wide open about the externalities here and how do you adjust uh, your uh, budgets and your goals to those. I, I think uh, since I'm a candidate at this point, it would be, you know, I don't really want to put recipes out there, but I would say that anything we do would need to come from the college and from the college in collaboration with other colleges. You've got a great dean of uh, the College of Liberal Arts that um, I'm sure he can bring together his leadership team and the faculty and have some good conversations. I think you identify the boundary conditions well and look to the college to suggest how they would like to address the realities that are out there. But every, every higher ed institution has the same pressures and there are some that have dealt with it well, including at Purdue. We've done some very nice things where our Dean of Liberal Arts has started a cornerstone program that you might look up. It's a 15 credit thing offered to STEM majors. He's written an op-ed in the Washington Post about it. Um, we all, he offers, out of his college, multiple degrees that can be taken in three years. So that, obviously, is an efficiency there. Um, we just, I think, greater collaboration between the different colleges, the different silos on campus, brings in, uh, I, I guess it's synergistic, it helps both sides. I would just say that I'm very deeply supportive of an education for students that is rich in the liberal arts, rich in the humanities. It, it, it helps everyone if we can find a way to support them. We're gonna transition now to the one-on-ones that many of you requested time for. Um, and Thank those you can be more, you can come. Here and
There's not a lot of time, so if some of you don't mind doubling up or tripling up for these, that would be great. And show my good side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you look like you have good sides all about. Yeah, following on from those questions, you had, um, um, I think I have this right, Enrique, the applications are down a little bit, and that's, that's uh, considered because the, the college rating is higher and it's a little bit more competitive. Do I have that right? Is that? One of the claims that is out there is that because we've made efforts to uh, increase the selectivity, you know, that that's having a, a negative impact on enrollments, but we would not agree with that. The, the, the effort to increase selectivity, it's about increasing quality. Yeah. Uh, the choices that students are making about what fields they're pursuing are sort of independent of, of those efforts to bring quality up. Well, it's fair to say, though, that the, the, the university standing has gone up in recent years. Oh, yes. And, and I mean, what would it be? Is that, was that part of the selling point for you to, to apply? For sure. For I mean, UVM is a great school, right? I'm not coming to fix something that's broken. It's, uh, President Sullivan's done a great job over the last few years. And it's nice to come to a place like this that has done well and, um, and has a great trajectory. So I, I feel very optimistic. In fact, when I met with the search committee, every one of them conveyed this optimism in their, even in their questioning. And so it's palpable. I, I felt the same on campus. I felt that when I met with the students this morning, the, the staff. Uh, so there's a lot going for UVM. Uh, and I hope that I can, in my small part, assist that along. Well, I think it's going to be a little bit more than a small part, probably, <laughs> as Prezi. <laughs> probably. Um, State appropriations in Vermont have, uh, to UVM have, have been pretty lackluster. They've been pretty flat. Vermont trails the nation and support for higher education. So to, to Vermont parents out there, what can you say, uh, what can you say about the trajectory of in-state tuition going forward, given those facts? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you mentioned state appropriations. I would venture to guess, although I, it's not a concrete statement, that your situation is not that different from most others. Our state appropriations have stayed flat as well. So, you know, and there, the state has challenges too. So I, I understand where that hap comes from. You talk about Vermont parents. I do believe that the, the high school graduation rate in Vermont is very high, and yet not very many people not very many of those students are coming to Vermont, to UVM. Um, I can tell you that I will do all I can to engage better with the state, uh, engage more deeply with the state. Um, you know, I, I used to lead the Office of Engagement at Purdue, and I, um, I really enjoy getting out into the state, getting to meet people. You'll see me do a lot of that. I have worked with three Republican governors in, in, uh, in uh, the state of Indiana. I worked with the Obama administration and, and Secretary Clinton's uh, State Department, so I feel very comfortable working with um, government agencies and delegations and such. So to the extent that we can prop up and support their um, feelings about UVM, great. But I think it would be unrealistic for us to expect that will go up. So as I said, in, uh, the, uh, a, an, in, an ever-increasing tuition, whether for in-state or out-of-state, is not particularly sustainable. You know, at some point, you may need to make small adjustment upwards, but that is not the source that you can rely on to balance all your books. And I, as I said, I will do all I can to uh, look to other more diversified sources to raise support so that um, students from Vermont have access to this jewel of a mm -hmm. university. Can I ask you, uh, can I ask an engineer a question about sports? <laughs> <laughs> you can ask. What role should varsity sports play for a university the size and with the resources of UVM? So my fundamental thought about athletics and sports is that it is an opportunity for our students to be leaders. At Purdue, despite our being a larger place in terms of athletics, um, our AD and our entire administration has focused on the student athlete, and the student is underlined in the student athlete. I think as long as we view athletics and sports as a, an opportunity for the students to grow, to uh, seize leadership opportunities, I think it's great. We want to make sure that there are the right controls in place, there are the, 
um, you know, that these, some of these scandals that are happening in other places don't. I'm very encouraged that Vermont's um, GSR and APR rates, the, the graduation rates and such, are extremely good. Um, I would certainly do all I could to continue to support that. But I think athletics has a very important, organic, and helpful place in a university of uh, your size and any size. Something some faculty have expressed some concern about is a, a $20 million grant to study bridge fuels um, at Purdue. So you say that one more time. A $20 million grant to study bridge fuels, which comes from the fracking process. Uh, you know, Vermont has some very you know, lofty environmental goals. How do you kind of square those two, you know, accepting that grant and becoming? Yeah. So the grant you're referring to, I believe, is the Engineering Research Center we received from the National Science Foundation. This is probably the most prestigious grant that NSF puts out. There are probably, probably about three or four that are uh, awarded out of hundreds of proposals. So it's an extremely prestigious uh, grant. I think if Vermont were to apply for a grant like that in any topic, it can be in you know, neuro-related research or, or uh, you know, 5G or whatever else, um, I think it would do very well for Vermont's, uh, for UVM's uh, reputation. Uh, to your point about uh, supporting fracking, I think that's a, that's a, my, 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 I would respectfully point out that it's a rather strange way of looking at that effort. Today, a lot of natural gas is flared at wellheads. It contributes significantly to global warming. If you can gather that gas and actually liquefy it and use it, you're far better off. So I think one should be careful about understanding the life cycle of these things. And my research happens to be in energy and energy efficiency and renewable energy. So I'd be very happy to engage with the students, the faculty, and have conversations around this space. But um, I think the, the work that our faculty are doing in, um, in, in sort of avoiding more methane uh, entering uh, the environment is very timely, and, and we're quite proud of that. About a year ago here at UVM, there were a number of student protests around issues of diversity and, and representation. Um, and one of the student demands in those protests was uh, a greater diversity among tenured faculty. Um, would you commit to diversifying faculty on, on campus? <laughs> commit to is an interesting story. I would, uh, interesting way to put it. I would love to. I think we all would like to have a more diverse uh, faculty, a more diverse staff, and more diverse students. Uh, more people of color, underrepresented folks. So uh, as, as everyone is aware across higher education and across the country, this is a very challenging area, a very complex area. We've certainly tried specific approaches at Purdue to enhance our undergraduate, uh, people coming into the undergraduate program uh, from underrepresented minorities, and we've had some measure of success. Um, it's hard for a state like Vermont to naturally attract uh, people of color, but uh, from my conversations with your inclu inclusive excellence group, I think people are working really hard at it. So, of course I commit to it. I would, I would love to see a more uh, diverse and, and inclusive uh, place, but I think, I think you're doing pretty well in terms of the focus on it, and I'll do all I can to contribute to that. How will you uh, work to, um, how should I put it, woo faculty who might have been, felt like they were left out of the hiring process? This hiring yes. process? Yes. So um, I think once they meet me, they fall in love, so it's easy. <laughs> but um, so today's meetings were, uh, were just great. I think that there are process questions, and I understand that Chairman Daigle has actually addressed the faculty and, and has explained the situation. The, my sense is that anytime faculty, st staff, students have questions, the most important thing is to hear them out. You can never please every single person on a campus, and yet what's important is to, to listen, to explain your decisions in, in very simple terms and be very transparent. And if asked, I would do the same thing. This particular issue, 
I feel completely absorbed about, right? I had no issues in participating in an open process. Um, I actually look forward to the open forum today. I enjoy being with people and learning about the place. So this wasn't a, a process I set up. On a more personal level question, Vermont has a different climate from where Purdue is. Uh, are you ready for that? Eh, not so different. It was actually colder in West Lafayette the last time I was here when the <coughs> polar vortex came through than, um, than, than it was in uh, Burlington. But uh, look, I've, I've lived in many places in the country. Um, if anything, the geography and the place is a great attraction. Burlington is just a beautiful place. Um, when the sole finalist thing was announced, so many of my colleagues wrote and said they were just jealous. They had either studied here or taught here. And uh, everyone said such positive things about this connected community and how beautiful the place is. And heck, they give me this lovely room in um, the Marriott and it overlooks Lake Champlain. I mean, what's to complain? <coughs> Have you always wanted to be a college president? Always is a long time. I'm an old man. Um, no, I've not always wanted to be anything specific. Things change with time. Uh, I was very happy being a faculty member and a researcher, and I'm very, you know, I have a very respected research career. Um, I, I really, really enjoy teaching and, and mentoring graduate students. It's a big part of what I've done. I've also contributed uh, increasingly to the, to the national conversation on science policy, et cetera, including on my, with my service in the National Science Board. So um, I think these things sort of evolve over time. Um, when I was asked to, to, be, to lead the Office of Engagement at Purdue, um, I never thought I'd be an administrator. But you know, one thing led to another. But at this point, I think that some of the experiences, some of the skills, uh, it seems like I, people think I'm good at it. Um, and I enjoy uh, sort of helping others. This is not about me. I, I'd really like to, any institution, any office I take, I'd really like to add value. Mm -hmm. If I'm not, I shouldn't be in that position. So I would do the same here. How, how old are you? Uh, you can figure it out. Look at my CV. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about your own education journey? Sure. And how, how you got sure. to where you are? So I got my bachelor's in, at IIT Madras in India. I, I went to Ohio State for a master's. I went to Berkeley for a PhD. Berkeley for PhD people. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I taught at the University of Wisconsin for about 10 years. I've been at Purdue for about 20 years. So I've been teaching about 30 years now. And uh, so the, the thing about my education is that it's all been through public institutions. I truly, truly believe that higher education is a, is a, is a jewel in the United States and we should do all we can to protect it. Mm -hmm. UVM has also tried to increase recruitment of international students. You have an international background. Can you tell us about, you know, how UVM might further that goal? Sure. We have about 10,000 international students at Purdue. So, uh, and the Dean of International Students reports to me, so I'm directly responsible for this. We have been very selective and, and focused about what we do internationally, not beyond simply recruitment. Um, we've chosen a couple of countries to go deep with, have a few goals about what we want to accomplish there. Um, and uh, so, I, I, you know, it's, this whole thing is a mix. I mean, you don't want so many of any of these, uh, if, if all your international students came from one country, then it, the diversity is lost. And so, if UVM chooses to, and if it's the right thing for UVM to, um, to sort of grow its international presence and, and student population. Uh, I have done a fair amount of it, and I'd be very happy to uh, plot a course for that. So what do you think is the role of corporate partnerships in higher education? That's something you've worked on at SVD. Sure. I mean, you've all asked multiple times about how do you balance resources and such. So it's a part of the puzzle. Most of these questions have a multifaceted sort of diverse, sorry, diversified answer. And so you want to do your best to um, position your faculty and staff and students to go after more and more of the federal funding pie. You want to see what your friends and donors and foundations will give you. Similarly, um, you know, corporations increasingly don't have what used to be called you know, Bell Labs and things. They don't have very large um, uh, research labs and efforts of their own. Therefore, 
I think universities can be in a very good place to um, engage with uh, companies in areas where the university has strengths, right? It's not simply a scattershot approach. If you have a, um, a, a cluster of faculty working in an area and they want to sort of engage with, uh, with a company to do sort of longer term fundamental research with them and, and advance an area and have an impact, um, we've certainly done a lot of it, and uh, and I'd be happy to help UVM do that. To circle back on something, and, and apologies for repeating this, but um, some faculty and students on campus have uh, raised concerns about um, the role of the humanities and, and what the administration is, is doing around the humanities. Um, and there's also been an enrollment drop in that area. Given that, would you cut funding or programs in the humanities or, or grow it, where, where would you go with that? Today is not the day I can answer that question because I don't know enough about the problem. Look, we've talked about across the U.S. There's this, this challenge exists. Liberal arts and humanities are facing declining enrollments and therefore the, the, there, are, there are multiple options. Either you try to increase your enrollment by enriching, refreshing your offerings, collaborating with other uh, 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 colleges and and you know coming up with programs that would be attractive to students that's that would be the ideal solution you cannot have uh, a continually declining enrollment and the same amount of resources spent there so something has to give and the answer is not for me to just dictate but for the faculty to understand and the faculty and the and the college administration to understand the the, the boundary conditions and arrive at creative solutions that I would be very happy to help with. And a portion of that is to also try to enhance the resources we can find that perhaps our, um, our happy alumni might want to support elements of it. And so this, all of these are an all of the above solution that you try to sort of tweak several things to try and keep things going. I will say though that Vermont has a long and storied history of being a strong liberal arts um, place, a school. And I will do all I can to continue to support that. And once more, I apologize for the repetition again, but... Uh, then don't repeat that. <laughs> um, well, so uh, Vermont has very high in-state tuition. What will you do to make, what would you do if you become president uh, to make UVM more accessible to Vermonters? As I said, one of the, at Purdue at least, our probably North Star goal is affordability and access. And we've done all we could, we've tweaked everything we could to freeze tuition, to make um, school more affordable. Uh, I see no reason why we shouldn't try something like that in Vermont. I, I honestly believe that you cannot have a trajectory of tuition that just continues to increase. It's just unsustainable. So I don't know what the right answer for Vermont is, for UVM is, but we need to find those answers and I think we will if I'm here. Does Purdue, Purdue have any variation of the incentive-based budgeting that is in place, at, in place here at UVM? And what do you think of IVB? So across the US, budget models vary all the way from completely centralized to completely decentralized. You can call it different things. And I will tell you that from many, many conversations with colleagues who are in both kinds of systems, it's not the budget model that leads to particular outcomes, it's a mechanism to track things. What's really needed is discretion and care and thought and discussion. None of the decisions that are being taken are a result, are a direct result of the incentive-based budget model. It's just a way to track the money. So I would say that I don't worry so much about which budget model, uh, the different budget models have different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, people often think that a, an RCM model, which is this distributed one, it, it sort of puts up barriers for interdisciplinary work. There are some too many programs that are started by each college, et cetera. Uh, there are similar challenges on the other side. So I, do, I don't think one should look at the budget model as a crutch for, and, and as a replacement for thoughtful decision making. And I would, I would do the latter. Uh, the, the thoughtfully think, you know, sort of work with the campus on, mm -hmm. on, on how we should use resources that are, are continually under 
um, stress, of course. So another thing that's come up, about, sorry. maybe just one more, and then we're gonna another, 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 another thing that's come up uh, was the Camp Dash shutdown at Purdue. Any thoughts on how that situation kind of got so dire, and is there anything you would have done differently, or do you think you handled the situation correctly? And you know, what are your thoughts on that? Camp Dash was an unfortunate occurrence. Um, for those who may not know, it was a, a, a research study of uh, sort of adolescent kids and um, kids from sort of the minority community, by and large, uh, underrepresented folks. And um, it, it had very good goals because there was some high blood pressure, uh, hypertension, et cetera, that was trying to address. Um, the IRB, the Institutional Review Board and such, studied the protocols and approved them as, they sh as, as is the standard process. It went wrong. It, the, the PI, the investigator, a very experienced, very well-known investigator, uh, things got out of hand. Um, it, it wasn't handled like it should have been. The moment we heard, we shut down the study and we commissioned a report that is more detailed than anything you could possibly dig up beyond that. It's a 52-page report. There's no redaction in there. We've been very open, very transparent, and very decisive. I'm very proud of how the Purdue administration handled that issue. I would rather we didn't have to handle it. It was an unfortunate incident. But we've also put practices in place that will hopefully avoid this kind of thing from happening again. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Is the VT Digger person here? That's me. OK. Yeah, that's You're me. Quigley. Aiden, yeah. OK. Hey, good. Nice to meet you. You write well. Thanks. Thanks. So thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Molly Walsh for seven days. Oh, we yeah. didn't actually get a chance to hear anything personal about you, your interests, family. Do you have any? I'm just a really fun guy. Come and meet me after I come oh, here. College age <laughs> kids. Have your yeah. kids gone through Yes. This? My, kids, uh, my daughter is a uh, sophomore at Purdue, and my son's a high school senior. He's just deciding right now which college he'll go to. Oh. So, yeah, I have a list. Sorry? You'll be on Mona's list? Sorry? You'll be on Mona's list? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was told by the enrollment folks that they can do things. Thank you very much, all of you.